Well, the pastor got us a new piece of equipment. Nathan said it was cute. <laughs> we'll see how it works. <laughs> well, good to be here this evening. All right, we've got two amens. We're off to a good start. <clears throat> well, how many of you believe the only reason you can stand is because of him? I want to call your attention to the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 2, this evening, and share something with you <clears throat> that I believe God has shared with me. I'm still working at this preparing messages thing, so you guys are just going to have to grow up with me here a little bit. Now, there's a lot of times I'll sit down to prepare a message, and it seems like uh, the Lord's just feeding my mind, and I'm just getting uh, point after point, and it's all coming together. And then there's times where... I feel like it's the whole Bible. It's like one, I just keep getting off on this and getting off on that. And I spent a number of hours yesterday trying to work this out. And after several hours and no success, I finally just got up and I told my wife, I said, I figured out that the Lord just wants me to stay up late at night and work on this stuff because I try to get it done early ahead in the day and no success. Well, the book of Ezekiel, chapter number two, I want to share really just one verse, and uh, I think this is probably the beginning of a series. I kind of like the idea of a series because it helps me focus my teaching. So this might be kind of keep me on point. But this is something that the Lord shared with me, and uh, really I'm just sharing with you a sermon that I've already had preached at me. <clears throat> and so human nature being what it is, I assume... <laughs> If it's working on my heart and on my life, I think the Lord could probably use it in your life uh, as well. There is something, you know, every once in a while you just get taken back. You got to get taken back to your childhood or something happens, sometimes even smells or something, and it just kind of takes you back. Well, I had that experience when I was reading this passage of Scripture, and I could almost hear my father's voice taking me back in, to a simpler time. And when we get here, maybe you'll see what I mean. Because I want you to read this verse, first of all, with your physical eyes. But then as you read it again, I want you to use your spiritual eyes. And let the Spirit speak this to your heart, just as if, as our pastor has often said, that this was a letter that's written just to you. And see if you don't see what I mean. We have here at the very beginning of Ezekiel's ministry, uh, the Lord coming to Ezekiel to share some things with him. And a great burden and calling that he was going to place on Ezekiel's life. And at this time, Ezekiel didn't really have any idea what awaited him uh, in the Lord's plans for his life. And the Lord had just came to him in chapter 1 and showed him some very wonderful things that we can't really even understand, some of the vision that he saw. Uh, and people for a long time have been trying to figure out what was he even talking about, trying to describe, almost as if what he was viewing was really beyond our ability to describe uh, with our limited language and abilities. But he's describing some of these things that he saw, and he saw things that uh, very few people have ever seen. And in chapter number 2, I'm going to read the entire chapter to give you a little, bit of the, a little bit of the flavor of the passage. And then I want to just call your attention to one verse in particular. In verse number 1 of Ezekiel chapter number 2, it says, And he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. And the Spirit entered into me when he spake unto me, and set me upon my feet, that I heard him that spake unto me. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me even unto this very day. For they are impudent children and stiff hearted. I do send them unto them, I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. And though thou, sh and though thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth, and eat that I give thee. And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, 
And there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. The particular verse I'd like to call your attention to this evening, and the one that kind of just smacked me right between the eyes, uh, is verse number 8. When he says, I, But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And I want you to read that just through a few times to understand what the Lord is asking of Ezekiel. He's coming to him at this early time of his ministry and he's, he's giving him some instruction. He's going to continue to reveal things to him as needed. And he tells him, open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. I almost got taken back to the dinner table when I was a kid and your parents are serving up something and it looks a little suspect, probably because it's green. And what did your mom or your dad probably say? Eat yeah, eat it. Just open your mouth and eat it. Here we have the Lord telling Ezekiel, kind of similarly, open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And as that, that verse really struck me very hard. And I want you to consider tonight, what is it exactly that the Lord has in your life that he's telling you this very thing? Because my guess is there's something. There's something that is, he brought into your life that maybe is a little uncertain, maybe a little distasteful even. It's not quite sure that we appreciate what he's bringing to pass in our life. Or we're at least not exactly sure where it's leading or what it holds for us. And the Lord telling us, uh, really calling upon us in faith, just eat what I give you. Just eat what I give you. How many times do we find ourselves resisting? Resisting what the Lord brings to pass in our life or resisting the things that God's trying to do in our life. I had a conversation on the, in the way home and I learned something from my 9 or 11 year old. She's not 9 anymore. And it actually sp kind of spurred an idea of a message. And uh, someday I'm going to teach that message. But it wasn't meant to be today. But the, main, the message was, what's waiting at the end of the second mile? Right? The Lord asks us to obey. He, he compels us. If someone asks you to go with them a mile, go with them too. And you know, there's a reason that he tells us to do these things. There's not oftentimes the experience that we could have to the fullest because we never get to the end of that second mile. We, we never really discover what the Lord really has for his children and his people because we never get there. If he's compelling us to go there, he has something in store for us. I want you to consider this evening that there are two storehouses, okay, that the Lord is the Lord of all things, and He's got two storehouses, okay? He has got blessings, and He has curses, and He is willing to open up the storehouse of blessing to His children. He opens the invitation to all and says, whosoever will may come and taste of the water of life freely. It's an open invitation the Lord has opened his warehouse, has opened the storehouse of blessing to the human race and said, through my son, Jesus Christ, you have access to all blessings. And there's not a single good thing withholding from us that's available to us through Jesus Christ. So you have the storehouse of blessing that is available to you. There's also the storehouse of curses. And God dispenses those as well. He's sovereign and he will judge the unrighteous. When God declares a curse, it shall surely come to pass. Have we not lived this? I mean, we've seen it, right? We understand how that works. So of which storehouse do we wish to partake is really the question. We talked in Sunday school this morning, and this lesson goes a little bit hand in hand with what we talked about. Uh, we're looking at authority for a couple weeks uh, as it was ordained by God. And there's two important things about authority that you should learn. And they are what? I shared them this morning. I just wanted to see if you remembered. Office, right? And jurisdiction. Very good. When you are looking at your life and you are trying to understand how God works in the authority aspect of how he works, because this is how he works, okay? He works through a, a specific process of authority, and you need to understand how that works plays out in his mind. So the two questions are this, when faced with any decision or any situation, what is my office and what is my jurisdiction? If we answer those two questions, we will solve 
an awful lot of our gripes and complaints and our problems. You know the, the parable of the unjust judge? What does the widow do? She continually comes and asks and beseeches. Why? Because there's one who has authority. Right? That's the attitude that we should have. When Paul had uh, the curse in the flesh that he wanted to remove, what did he do? Did he complain about it? Did he gripe about it? Did he tell everybody how hard of a time he had it and why his life was harder than anybody else's life and nobody had ever had it like he had it? No, he didn't do any of that. He said he, he joyed in tribulation. He had a, a request of the one who told him, I'm not going to do that for you. I'm not going to answer your request in the affirmative like you want me to do. And Paul said, good enough. You know, he asked, this is the attitude. So I ask you this evening, what is it that the Lord is saying, open thy mouth and eat that I give thee? Because I know in my life there's a number of things that if I had a magic Isaac wand and I could just wave it around and make stuff happen, I would probably do a few things a little differently, right? We might change a few of our circumstances. We might change a few things and our, tilt the tables in our favor just a little bit. But that's not really in our jurisdiction, is it? God says, open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. He wants to share from his storehouse of blessing. He comes to Ezekiel because the entire nation of Israel was rebellious. And if you actually look at the words that are used as, as he's talking about the rebellion, it starts out as disobedience and it ends up with kind of a bitter disobedience. You know, bitterness is a big part of rebellion. We talked about that this morning a little bit. If I'm discontent or bitter about my lot, my office and my jurisdiction, I might seek someone else's, right? I'm kind of throwing it back at God's feet and saying, ah, it's not good enough. I want something else. Bitterness is a, is a problem we need to address. So Ezekiel's being commissioned, and he's being warned against being rebellious. Being rebellious. What is the revealed will of God in our life, and why is it that we struggle with obedience? Why is it we struggle with accepting authority? It's because of our carnal nature, our flesh, right? I believe, I'm going to say this very bluntly and frankly. You see, the, you see this room, you see how it's not full? Why is this room not full? Because the world is full of rebellion. People do not want what God is offering them. It's not important to the average Joe in our society what God wants from them in their life. What's important to them is what they want for them in their life. Okay, so this room is not full because the world is full of rebellious, stiff-hearted people. The caution God gives us is to not be stiff-hearted. You know, there's just as many stiff-hearted, rebellious Christians as there are stiff-hearted, rebellious, lost people. Ask yourself, have you, have you ever heard something from the Word of God that you've continued to live in disobedience to? I mean, the, the Spirit comes to us and compels us through, through that still, small voice and says, you need to listen. And we don't because we're rebellious. Oftentimes you read through the Old Testament, what do you find in the prophets is that the prophets themselves identified with the sinful nation. He said, we have sinned, right? In Christianity today, we seek to set up a kind of a partition that says, you know, well, I used to be a sinner, <laughs> right? I used to be lost. And certainly there's things that have changed. But let's not kid ourselves into believing that we don't need repentance in our time. Repentance is a very real need, right? So rebellion is something that we need to understand. How do we understand rebellion? Well, you'll learn more about it in Sunday school next week. But we understand rebellion by understanding authority. Because when we subvert the authority that God has put in our life, we are rebellious. We are, we're choosing another path other than what God has revealed for us. And the world does that on a regular basis. And even children of God struggle to understand, just like King David, why, uh, do the, why does it seem like the wicked prosper in their way? And why, does it seem, why is this room not full? Why is, the, why is the ball field down the street full of hundreds or thousands of people, but God's house uh, sits sparsely populated most times 
day in and day out. Why is this, should this be the case? It's because of rebellion. We do not understand or believe the truth of what God says. And the reason we continue to live in rebellion is because we do not believe the truth of what God says. God has over and over again in his word revealed the consequences of rebellion, right? And yet we have seen in this church generation of young people come through these doors for years and go out into the world choosing to live as they please, believing the deception and the lie that I am not accountable to anyone now. I'm an adult. I've come into my own. I get to make my choices for myself. And no one's here to hold me accountable. That's a lie of the devil. There is accountability. And you one day will stand before that almighty judge. And he was going to certainly hold all of us accountable for every decision we made. Why did you not make attending my house a priority? Why were you content to live in rebellion and allow your family to suffer? Why did you bring the storehouse of curses upon you and all of your family and deny them the blessings of my love and deny them the blessings of my word and deny them the blessings of everything I have for them in Christ by choosing to live selfishly and wickedly and ignore the truth of my word? One day those questions will be asked. And they'll be asked of you and they'll be asked of me. Why did we choose, knowing what we know, to live the life that we lived? Because we will be held accountable for everything that we know. The books will be opened, and none of this is a mystery to anyone in this room. right? It's, it's here. It's been revealed. It's manifest. Eat that I give thee. Are you willing to eat and partake of what the Lord has for you? Are you willing to do what is necessary to be spent for others that they too might experience the love of Christ? Are you willing to deny yourself and to get on board with the ministry that Christ has for each of us and to say, I'm going to follow his footsteps? When we get to the, we're going to go to John 15 at the end of this uh, lesson here tonight, but before we do, I want to share a couple thoughts. If you go through this passage of Scripture, really the Lord is preparing Ezekiel because he's going to commission him to go. He's saying, before you go, I need you to make some commitments, right? Now, we, are, we seldom use the word commitments nowadays because we're not too fond of the idea that we could be committed to something and be expected something of us. But this is what the Lord was doing. And as of yet, he hadn't even revealed to Ezekiel what was going to be involved. He simply said, there's some things you need to do to prepare yourself so that your heart is ready to partake of what I have for you. Let's take a look. There's a few things he shares through this chapter. In verse number 1 of chapter 2, and you'll have to just bear with my voice this evening. It's a little scratchy. He said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet and I will speak unto thee. Let me ask you this question. Now we'll read the second verse, and we'll find that the Lord brought this to pass himself. But do you believe that the Lord would have spoken had Ezekiel refused to stand? You see, we wonder why we don't see the Spirit of God move anymore. And I think it's because the people of God seldom move anymore. We have become content. We have become complacent. And we have gotten comfortable with our situation. And this is exactly what God is saying. He's saying, I don't want you to be comfortable. You're going to stand up and let's have a talk. It'd be like me saying, let's all stand for the entire service. Would that be very comfortable? No, but what God's saying is, I want you to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Does that make sense? God wants you to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And he tells Ezekiel, I want you to stand up. A simple thing, but demonstrates a willing heart in obedience. I have seen Christians get such a bad attitude over the dumbest, smallest things that have been asked of them. And they become bitter, and they become angry, because they don't want anything to be asked of them. They don't, don't ask anything of me in the service of Christ. I'm here so Christ can serve me with his blessings and take me to heaven when I die, and that's it. That's a false gospel. If that's the gospel of which you have believed, you have believed a false gospel. 
And it's time you get in the Bible and learn of the true Christ and his gospel. Because that's not the gospel that he taught. He said that you will pick up your cross and you will follow me. And then I will be your shepherd and you will be my sheep. If you don't believe that, you have believed a false gospel. God wants us to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 18 says, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. Let me ask you this question. If we had things our way, how often would we experience the grace of God? How often would we be able to partake of the grace that Christ offers if we had everything our way? We wouldn't, would we? We would never know the fullness of His grace and His love that He shares with us, the comfort that He can bring our hearts, because we would never have a problem in our world. We'd never have a need for His grace. In His love and His mercy, He allows us to endure things so that we can draw near to Him and experience His love and His grace. He says, most gladly, therefore. So once I got that answer, and the Lord said, finally, just said, no, Paul, this is the last time. I don't want you asking anymore. This is done. I'm not going to take that away. My grace is all you need for that. And Paul says, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Paul's attitude was, if that, oh, now that I get it, if that's what it takes to be close to the Lord Jesus Christ, then bring the infirmities. That's what I want. He said, I will glory in those infirmities. How often do we have that attitude today that we willingly eat what he gives us? Or do we rather moan and groan and gripe that the husband we got is a louse and the wife we got is bitter and our children don't listen and my job is terrible and my boss is a nincompoop and everything in my life is terrible and I don't make enough money and everything's just going down the tubes and I don't even know why I'm here, right? It's just complaint after complaint after complaint, and my eyes isn't what it used to be, and I got this little pain in my hip, and my feet bother me. I can't attend church because my feet bother me, and they make me stand to sing, and my knees, one knee's going bad on this side, and then I have been overcompensating, and my other knee's going bad now. It's just every continual complaint. What did the Lord tell Ezekiel? Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Just open your mouth and eat and partake and trust. This is where faith matters, okay? Faith is not a big I hope so. Faith is believing that what God says is true and putting it into practice. And as I exercise those things in my life, I will discover the truth of what he has said. Not because I hope, but because I'm experiencing it in my life as I put his word into practice. We need to understand that infirmities may be something that he asks us to partake of. The reproaches, the necessities, the persecutions, the distresses, everything that Paul talked about. The second thing he talks about is in verse number four. He says, I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. So you're going to stand, you're going to go. And you're going to speak the message you are given. You're going to speak the message you're given. We don't have to invent things to say. And we need to be careful about putting words into God's mouth. That happens way too often. Putting words in God's mouth is not why we're here. It's not as if he didn't give us anything to work with. We don't have to invent more. He gave us plenty and he said... What you're going to do is I'm going to take you, Ezekiel. I'm going to commission you. Are you standing up? Okay, you're listening. Stand up and listen. I'm going to take you. I'm going to commission you. And you're going to go. And he'll, he'll, if you notice the passage, he hasn't even given what he's going to say yet. He just says, you're going to go and you're going to speak, thus saith the Lord. What he's telling him is, I'll give you the rest as you need it. But what you need to know right now is I'm sending you to speak my word. Not to speak your word, to speak my word. The wickedness of man's heart is great. And there are a lot of people professing to follow Christ who spend a lot of time trumpeting their achievements and their righteousnesses and their successes and their overcoming. 
None of that is our own. If there is any victory, if there is any overcoming, if there's any grace, if there's any successes, it's all of Jesus Christ. And what we need to focus on in our messaging, which I know is a big hot button topic these days, and it's important, you need to understand your messaging because you have been given a message. And the message is this, it's Jesus Christ. He's the one who's coming to judge. He's the one you need to make peace with. Not me. You don't need to live up to meet my standards. My standards are garbage. I try my best to understand what the Lord would have of me, and I seek to understand His will for my life. But my standards are nothing. My standards are filthy rags. I'm not going to judge anybody. I'm going to stand accountable to the Lord Jesus Christ, just as each and every one of you. Some of you in this room are going to stand accountable for other people before the Lord Jesus Christ. As in your wives and your children, and how did you conduct yourself, and how did you lead your home, and what kind of godly example were you, and what kind of environment did you provide for your family? Did you put as much tender love and care into the environment for your family as God put into the creation when he put you in it? Those are the kind of things that we are going to have to be accountable for. Our message should be his message, and his message is clear. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We don't have to get off into the little nuanced areas of our best performance. You ever notice how a lot of Christians, that they want to talk about things where they excel, right? If I, if I don't have a problem with alcohol, I can get up and rail against alcohol until the cows come home. Why? Because that's not a weakness for me. I don't have a struggle there. We just need to take the whole counsel of God and look at it into ourselves. People say, well, you're being judgmental, right? I, I think this is a little comical, to me at least. If you're looking at me telling me I'm judgmental, are you being judgmental? <laughs> Did you just judge me and condemn me as someone who's judgmental? Maybe. I don't know. It's kind of this weird irony between, uh, you know, human beings. But we need to take the scriptures and examine ourselves. <laughs> and this is what we preach. I love what Brother Harvin said. We preach and we really prophesy to the wind, right? We, we pray the Spirit to move in the hearts of men as we speak the Word of God, right? Your silent witness will never win anyone to Christ. Your, your silent testimony, you know, your walk talks louder than your talk talks so you don't have to say anything, that's also a false gospel. <laughs> it's the Word of God that has the power to save. You must open your mouth and you must speak it or people will never have opportunity to believe what they have not heard. I believe the scripture teaches that. So we're going to teach his message. We're going to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And in verse number six, probably most importantly, he says, thou son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. What Ezekiel had been given the job to do was one out of hundreds of thousands to take a stand for what was right and to speak the word of the Lord. And the Lord's telling him, don't be afraid of their faces. Don't be afraid of their attitudes. Don't be afraid of their looks towards you. Just say what I have given you to say. You know, we often confuse popularity with victory. Popularity and victory are not the same. A lot of times the message won't be popular, and we, th and we may even buy into the lie of the devil that, well, there's only ever been just a few people believe. I've been, I've been preaching the gospel, and I've been sharing the testimony of Jesus Christ for years, and there's only ever been just a couple people believe my testimony. Don't let the devil trick you into putting the word just or only in front of that. I want you to consider the value of what one soul's worth. The Bible says that all of heaven rejoices at the repentance of one sinner. In other words, when there's one sinner on this earth that comes to know the Lord and repents of their sin and turns in faith towards God, heaven has a party every time that happens. And we act like that's not good enough. We, we need more than that. That's a big deal. If one soul gets reached or one person gets reached, 
And through your entire life's testimony and ministry, can you say it was worth it? I think you can when you get to the other side and you realize the difference that that made and the value that Christ puts on the human soul. It is a great, great price that he paid, and we do a disservice to him when we allow our fears to inhibit our ministry to others. <coughs> is that the, when we say we have the mind of Christ, we, we take the, we're going to conform to the image of Christ, consider what he faced, and ask yourself, have I faced anything like that? Now, usually most everything we face is right up here. This is what we face. It's all the fears and concerns of what could happen. Let me tell you a certainty. If you don't share the gospel, people will die and go to hell. That you have known and lived among and talked to and been family with and been friends with. Does that make sense? People that all of us know are going to stand at the judgment one day and maybe they're going to be looking across at us as the sheep to the goats. And, and they might be looking over here and saying, really? You're over there with the sheep? You never said anything to me. We were neighbors. We were family. We were cousins. I'm your aunt. Who knows? But all of those people will be in one of those two camps. Is it worth being uncomfortable? Is it worth getting out there a little bit and, and being not afraid? <coughs> last thing, and I said the last one is probably most important. It's not. Verse number 8 is most important. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. I want you to stop and consider how many voices are in this world. How many voices are in this world trying to get your attention, vying for your attention, vying for your heart, vying for the hearts and minds of your children. The world is full of voices. It's full of voices. Who are you listening to? Who are you listening to? Try the spirits, the Bible says. You make a decision to lay out a church, who are you listening to? You make a decision to spend the Lord's tithe at Burger King, who are you listening to? You make a decision to flip over to that country music station. What voice are you listening to? When you make a decision to spend your money at the movie house, what voices are you listening to? When you make decisions in your life each and every day, there's all kinds of voices, and there's, it's not any small coincidence that the world is full of all kinds of things to keep your attention. They're just going to keep you saturated, right? The stupid little phones... I mean, good grief, it's a little weird and creepy. I thought I slipped into a, a bad movie the other day when I was driving in a, down an intersection and I was in the turning lane and I drove past nine drivers in a row all staring at their phones. It was like some kind of weird movie where everybody's just sucked in, can't escape. Who are you listening to, kids? Yeah. Falling asleep in church and then you can't wait to get together after church and look at the latest Mimi on your phone or whatever stupid thing? What voices are you listening to? You need to understand there's more voices in the world competing for your heart and mind than just the Holy Spirit. If, if you want to hear the Holy Spirit, it might take some effort on your part. You might have to participate in the process. You might have to get engaged. You might have to actually get in the Word. The Lord says, hear what I say. What is, the, what is contrary to hearing what He has to say? It's rebellion. He says, hear what I say, be not thou rebellious. Be not thou rebellious. There is more, if we could ever understand the sum, and I, and I think really this is probably the biggest issue of our time in churches. The biggest issue in our time in churches, hands down, is rebellion. The reason, God, do you think God is going to move and bless whenever we have so much rebellion in our hearts and in our lives, I find it hard to believe he's going to have to move and do a work of repentance. And if we could understand God's plan for authority, it might help us understand our rebellion a little better. 
the murmuring and the complaining. Why did Aaron's rod ever bud? As a testimony against the rebellion. It was a testimony against the rebels, the people who would not accept God's authority. And that was part of the testimony. Say, okay, all of you people that want to be your own authority and think that God has no right over your life, then bring your rods and set them all in here if that's your lot. And God said, I will show among you who I have given the authority to. And lo and behold, the next day, Aaron's rod had budded and produced almonds. That's pretty spectacular, isn't it? Do you think God cares about authority? I think he cares a great deal that we understand authority. Because if we don't understand authority, the only thing left for us is rebellion. Yeah. It's just rebellion. We're scared of authority because we don't trust people anymore. We're scared of, because we don't trust anybody that they're actually going to have our interests at heart. Right? So whether the trust is broke down between the kids and the parents, or the husband and the wife, or the boss and the employee or the pastor and the church, wherever the trust is broken down, there's going to be rebellion. Because everyone begins acting in their own interests. God's cautioning Ezekiel, and I believe cautioning us as well. Hear what I say unto thee. Listen to me. Do you hear him saying that? Do you hear him saying, listen to me? Oh, they muted my mic for effect. Hold on. Do you hear him saying, listen to me? Some of you don't hear it because you're asleep. I'm trying to wake you up. Yeah, you're asleep. You're not listening. Which is funny because that's what I'm preaching about. If we're not listening, then you will hear something else. You're not going to hear nothing. If you're not hearing what God's saying, you will hear something else. He says, Hear what I say unto thee, Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. I want you to turn over to the book of John, chapter number 15, and we'll close with this thought. Make a note of that. Sometimes I want to use these. <laughs> <coughs> Connor told me he wasn't going to fall asleep today. Still doing all right? Okay, good deal. In John, chapter number 15... I want to share with you a thought that I hope and I believe will go beyond what you've probably thought as it relates to this passage ever before. It may. I want to share it with you. In <clears throat> John 15, verses number 8 and 9, the Lord speaking, He says, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. Okay? You with me so far? The Father's glorified by your life, bringing forth much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. In verse number 9, as the Father hath loved me. You with me so far? This is big. As the Father hath loved me, okay, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Okay. This is what I want you to consider in light of our context of eat that I give thee. Okay? We're the branches in the vine. How do the branches get fed? From the vine. Okay? Do the branches have a lot of say so? No. You're not going to have a lot of say so, but if you want to be alive, you stay in the vine. So you're going to eat what the Lord gives you to eat. Spiritually speaking, eat that I give thee, okay? Open your mouth, eat what I give you. Enough with the murmuring and the complaining and the whining. It's time to grow up and be a man. Eat what I give you. I've got a purpose. I've got a reason. Just trust me. He says, as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Ask yourself this question. When he says, as the Father hath loved me, 
reflect on that for just a minute and ask, what did that look like? Ask yourself what it looked like for the father who loved the son. What did, he, what did he do and ask of him in that relationship? The father who loved the son went to the son and asked him to eat what he gave him. He said, this is not going to be easy, but if you eat what I give you, Something better is coming. I've got something waiting for you. There's a joy set before you. I've got a people for you to redeem. I've got a people for you, and they'll be all your own. I want to give them to you. But in order for me to give them to you, you're going to have to go and pay the price. Jesus Christ talking to his disciples, saying, even as the Father has loved me, okay, the same way the fathers loved me. This is how I have loved you. If you go down to verse number 16, he makes an interesting comment. He says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit. Why? Why would the Son desire for his disciples to bring forth fruit? We just read the answer in verse number 8. Herein is my Father glorified. You see, who does the Son love? The Son loves the Father. And He knows how much the Father loves Him. And He's saying, I'm not going to go through all of this for nothing and have nothing to return to my Father. Because I know how much my Father loves me. And so, since He loves me, I'm going to break sure my disciples bring forth much fruit, because that's how he's glorified. You see, in the Father and the Son, we see a miraculous, one-of-a-kind relationship of complete trust and complete love and complete faithfulness. You don't, you don't find that anywhere else. You should. I mean, it's the pattern, it's the design, but in our sinful fallen state, we're not quite there yet. Not quite there yet. But Christ is saying, that's the relationship I have with my Father. And he said, guess what? Just the same way the Father loves me, I have loved you. In that context, what is he asking his disciples to do? He's asking them to give themselves. He's saying, continue ye in my love. You must give yourself. You must. You must give yourself the same way that the Father gave me. Continue in that. Can you handle that? This is almost when you expect the disciples to just stop and say, this is a hard saying. You know, like, are you asking me what I think you're asking me? Because I know you said the Father sent you to die for others. And now you're saying that just the way he loved you, you love us that much? Yes, that I want you to go and do that. Right? Continue ye in my love. Are you willing to eat that I give thee? Are you willing to eat that I give thee? This is the question of God to you. Go back to Ezekiel. Don't read it with your eyes. Read it with your heart. And ask yourself, am I willing to eat what I am given? It struck me like a ton of bricks. Eat what I give you. Just do it and leave the rest to me trust me it's my message it's my work just eat what i give you to eat amen, amen. get comfortable being uncomfortable get comfortable being uncomfortable that's contrary to our culture most of you look a little too comfortable right now my eyes are getting heavy right but what happens when our flesh is weak He's strong in us. He's strong in us. So sometimes it's just a matter of asking yourself, okay, I think I can develop an appetite for that. Can you? That's what the Lord's asking us to do. Get hungry, right? Because you've got some eating to do. You've got some things to feed you in your spiritual life. Pastor? Pastor?